Good afternoon, everybody. This is an energized crowd. <laughs> My name is Grace Valenzuela, and I'm the, um, the, the Executive Director for Communications and uh, Community Partnerships for the District. So that's a new role that I have in the, in, the, in the district right now, and I know that many of you know me as the multilingual director for many years. Um, so welcome to the Parent uh, University Kickoff event. We are so excited about today's program and having you all here. So thank you very much for coming on a beautiful Saturday uh, afternoon. As you know, Parent U is designed to help you empower your children to succeed in school in, an, in, in our diverse and ever-changing world. I want to specifically thank our superintendent, Javier Botana, the members of the board, Portland Board of Education, and the members of the superintendent's cabinet, the members of the district's parent advisory committee, Portland Empowered, um, officers of the members of the PTOs of the various schools and the staff of the Multilingual Center for their input in putting together the vision and the concept of Parent University to reality. We also want to extend our appreciation to Maine Community Foundations, People of Color Fund, and the Margaret Burnham Trust for their support and sponsorship of uh, today's pro program of Parent University. And thank you to YMCA for providing today's uh, program for our children in the gym. Um, this session is being simultaneously interpreted. So I want to remind our speakers today to kindly observe the pace of your speech. And if you see one of them behind there, um, raise their hand that means that you have to slow down a little bit so that they can catch up with you. Okay, and to start us off, we'll hear from Anna Trevorrow, Chair of the Portland Board of Education. Thank you, Grace. Good afternoon. As Chair of the Portland Board of Public Education, I'm excited to be here with you today at the inaugural session of Parent University. I'm excited about Parent U because the focus of this new initiative is on helping parents and caregivers help their children. In other words, Parent U is all about our Portland Public Schools families. The school board considers families to be vital partners in the education of Portland's children. We consider the role of families so important that the board last March passed a new school and family partnership policy. That policy was developed after months of discussion and study by the Parent Partnership Policy Ad Hoc Committee. That committee had representation from all stakeholders, including parents, educators, administrators, school board representatives, and Portland Empowered. Portland Empowered is a project of the University of Southern Maine Muskie School of Public Service that works to champion parent voice and to improve educational outcomes for students. Portland Empowered helped craft the new policy. The ad hoc committee integrated elements of Portland Empowered's parent and family engagement manifesto into our new policy. The manifesto is a document that outlines the ways that Portland public schools can better engage with parents and families. Our new policy states that, school, that the school board honors the diversity of our families and recognizes that parents, guardians, and other family members play an important role in helping their children succeed in school. It also says that the board encourages partnerships between district administration, schools, and families in order to share the responsibility of educating our students. The board believes that our students will thrive if we welcome, inform, engage, and empower families to support their children 
in school and build strong school communities. Parent U is the latest example of the ways that the Portland Public Schools is working to engage and empower families. Parent U will focus on trending educational topics that have meaning for parents and families today. For example, today's topic is about the benefits of the kind of diverse schools we have in Portland. Another example is an upcoming session in February that focuses on the increasing rates of anxiety in today's young people. That session will screen the documentary titled Angst, Raising Awareness Around Anxiety, and explore what parents and schools can do to help children and youth manage stress and be more resilient. In addition to helping parents and caregivers, Parent U also will help the school board. The community discussions that come about as we explore such critical and timely topics will not only help parents develop effective tools for helping their children, but also help guide the board in its policy making. What we all learn together at Parent U can guide the board in developing policies that are responsive to important contemporary educational issues. Thank you for being here today and participating in Parent U. And now, let the learning begin. But before the learning begins, you got to listen to me. Um, good, um, good afternoon. I'm Javier Boltana. I'm the proud superintendent of the Portland Public Schools. And I am so thrilled to see so many people come out for the opening event of Parent University. This is um, something that we are incredibly excited about. Um, we believe, and it's one of our core strategies as a school system, that um, we need to really work hard to expand our parent engagement um, for us to be able to be the school district that we know that we can be. And um, so it's incredibly rewarding to see uh, so many of you come out on this uh, beautiful Portland afternoon in the middle of the winter. We don't get that many of them. So for you to choose to spend time with us is an honor and a privilege, and I am um, extremely grateful for that. Um, I want to recognize uh, Grace Valenzuela and her team. <laughs> you met behind the door over there and um, the rest of uh, the team because they've done a tremendous job organizing this event and um, uh, we couldn't do any of the things that we do without the staff that work so hard to do that. I also want to recognize that we have a good number of our principals here, a good number of our teachers who have taken time this afternoon to be a part of um, this event. Many of them are also parents in the system, uh, residents of Portland, and value what it is that we're here to talk about, which is the diversity of our, um, of our schools. So I'm incredibly grateful to them for also taking time this afternoon to be here. So let me talk a little bit about Parent U. Um, as you heard before, Parent U is our effort to engage parents in the work of the district. Um, I'm speaking today as someone who is both an educator but is also uh, a parent of a student in the Portland Public Schools. And I love being a parent, but I also know from experience that it can be challenging, particularly when your child... I'm sorry. Guys, I will do my best. You know that I tend to uh, get on a roll. Um, I know from experience that it can be challenging to know how best to guide our students as they learn and grow. I think it's even harder today than when we ourselves were kids. Today's young people are part of iGen, a generation that constantly has smartphones and other devices in their hands. They're great at texting and social media, but not so great at personal interaction with their friends and family. At least in my house, that's true. Um, that's why this generation is experiencing increasing levels of anxiety. The purpose of Parent U is to help us, parents and, care and caregivers, learn from experts and each other about ways that we can help our kids succeed in school and in life. Parent U offers free classes and events that are fun 
interactive, and informative, and that will focus on topics that are important for today's families. Why do we call this forum a university? The dictionary says a university is an educational institution designed for instruction of students in many branches of advanced learning. And Parent U will have many branches. We'll focus on a wide variety of topics. We'll include how parents can model a positive growth mindset to help their children persevere when school becomes challenging, how to use art to discuss sensitive topics with our children, and how to raise healthy and resilient girls and also healthy and resilient boys. Among other offerings, I'll be offering a lunchtime book discussion group in March about raising iGen children. We'll focus on what we need to know and understand about today's hyperconnected youth. The learning at Parent University will be provided by experts. Those experts would, will not only be research and professors, researchers and professors, um, such as our guest speaker today, but also you, uh, our parents and caregivers. As anyone who's attended a college or university knows, you learn from your classmates as well as from your professors. At Parent U, we will also look to each other to share our expertise, to share our knowledge on specific topics. One way that Parent U is unlike other universities is, and this will be good news, for me, there will be no tests and there will be no grades. You can attend as many or as few sessions as you like, and our hope is that you and all will succeed at Parent U in gaining knowledge that helps you to help your children. We at the Portland Schools consider parents to be our partners. Research shows that parents can help increase their children's success by being involved in their children's education and in their community. Thank you all for being involved here today at our Parent U kickoff session. Dr. Amy Stewart Wells, a professor at Columbia University, will lead us in a discussion today about how to create truly integrated public schools that prepare our children for life in today's global society. And I want to take a second to talk about the Portland Public Schools because I think we're uniquely positioned to achieve this because we are by far the most diverse district in Maine. To give you a sense of our diversity, 36% of our students come from a home where English is not the first language spoken. English is not the first language of about 25% of our students. Our students speak more than 60 languages our students and their families speak more than 60 languages. And more than 43% of our students are students of color. And more than half of our students qualify for, free and reduced, um, for the federal free and reduced lunch program. We also have many students who are financially advantaged. And our data shows that our financially advantaged students compete favorably with students from any school district in the state and country on traditional measures of performance, such as test scores. But as I think you will learn today, they also have a competitive advantage because of the schools that they attend here in the Portland Public Schools. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. In our classroom, students learn side by side with students who have different worldviews and experiences. And together, they're able to build knowledge by challenging each other to think beyond their specific experiences and conditions and create together a stronger school community and community of Portland. And our data also shows that our financially disadvantaged students do not have the same outcomes. And as a district and as a community, we can't be satisfied if zip code, family income, lack the parents' education level, or uh, whether they speak English as a first language or not, determines our outcomes. That's part of our equity goal as the Portland Public Schools. And it's one of the reasons that we've started Parent University to bring us all together, to understand each other, to be able to work together as parents who care about our children to improve the outcomes for all of our students. I know that every person in this room, every person who sends their 
children to the Portland Public Schools is committed to the ideals of diversity on which this country is founded. That is what makes Portland special. That's what makes the work that we're trying to do unique in the state of Maine and unique in the country, and one of the reasons that I'm so proud to lead this school district. I would like to thank you once again for being here and take a moment to introduce our speaker. Dr. Amy Stewart Wells is a professor of sociology and education at Teachers College at Columbia University. And she's the president-elect of the American Education Research Association. She is the director of The Public Good, a public school support organization, and also reimagining education, teaching and learning in racially diverse schools, which is a professional development teacher institute. She's the author and editor of five books and more than 50 articles and book chapters on issues of race and education. As a researcher who's interviewed thousands of parents about, why, about what they want for their school-aged children, Dr. Wells is an ideal speaker for our first session of Parent University. Please help me welcome Dr. Amy Stewart Wells. Thank you for having me, and thank you all for being here on this warm, mean January Saturday. Um, and I'm, this is the Parent University sounds amazing, and I think the tuition's a lot cheaper than my university, so <laughs> it's good. Um, so I'm going to start today by telling you the password for my bank account. I'm not going to tell you which bank, though, but um, my password is shunning gifted education. So I opened that bank account when my son was in middle school, or going into middle school. And for those of you who know, the New York City system is choice run amok, right? So there are very few zoned middle schools anymore. So when he was approaching middle school, we had to, he'd gone to a very racially diverse neighborhood elementary school, and um, then was in the process of making choices for middle school. And most of the white upper middle class kids in his elementary school were heading into a gifted middle school, where you were only admitted based on, um, actually your, uh, would have been fifth grade test score, fourth grade test scores, um, the state tests. And uh, so we made a decision to put my son in a different school that was very racially diverse and didn't track. And so I had no gifted program and even no tracking. Um, and you would not believe the reaction I got from my peers who lived near me in my neighborhood. And um, several of them said things like, huh, I thought your son had high test scores. I said, he does. <laughs> oh, so why isn't he going to Delta? I said, because we don't want him to and he doesn't want to. So that's a way to tell you what it's like, the peer pressure you feel, if you, particularly if you're a white, upper middle class and your kid has high test scores, to make a different decision. So I opened up that bank account that year, and I was like, I like this password, OK? Shunning gifted education. Because I knew as a parent, um, my own intuition was what my son really needed and what our society needed, right? Was a school that was caring, supportive. Um, my son is cognitively kind of, he's very good at test scores. He, he, at, at tests, he is, does have high test scores, but he needs more scaffolding on social emotional development. So I knew as a parent what my son needed, and I knew the school I was putting him in, which wasn't the highest status school in my district, but it was a school where he would grow and thrive, and, and that happened. And I just want you to know my son has gone on to get into a highly selective university. So, um, so hence, now you know my password. But I'm, so I'm going to talk a little bit about how that intuition of mine is related to a whole body of research, um, which I happen to know and tried to disseminate to a lot of my peers who were putting their kids in the school where they weren't very happy, many of them. So um, it didn't, that didn't really work. But since you're here to listen to me talk about it, I'm assuming it might work here. Um, so we're going to go through. I'm, they have a lot of slides that I used in the, in the last meeting, and we're going to skip through some of the historical things and focus more on those related to the parents because I have a little less time right now. So go ahead. So there's a lot of reasons why we should support racially, ethnically diverse schools. 
and why we should be shunning gifted education. And I'm saying gifted education when it's a, a label that's put on some kids based on one or two test scores. Um, because I think all kids are gifted. And I think every child needs a gifted education. And I think that the world we want to prepare our children for is a world where they think like that. Okay, that they don't just think kids who do well on one measure are the, are the only gifted ones, okay? So our children are entering a society that's much more diverse. Um, since 2014, the public schools in this nation have been not, no longer, are no longer majority white. Um, so this is their cohort moving for her, forward. Um, and just the, for in 2013 was the first time there were more babies of color born in the U.S. Than white, than white babies. So this society as a whole is changing very quickly, particularly for the cohort of, of young people today. And more importantly, we have millennial parents now who are becoming the majority parents in our public schools. And millennial parents are much more open to interracial marriage. They're much more open to living in racially diverse communities. Um, and they're more progressive, they're more politically independent, less likely to be religious. I mean, these are just all factors that come up. So it's a different generation of parents, too, who are more open to these ideas. Um, racial attitudes over the last half century have changed dramatically in this country, at least what people say on opinion polls. Um, so we are more open as a society to racially diverse communities, schools. So this is all looking good. Our data are looking good. We're heading towards more diverse public education. Um, this is just a dramatic shift, particularly if you go back to the 1950s. But today, about 71% of parents um, felt that increasing diversity and integration in public schools was a good thing. Okay. The other thing that should be a major factor for all parents today is that employers and colleges say they want to see high school graduates who have some intercultural understanding, who've been to diverse schools. So when I went um, college shopping with my son, I heard it again and again and again in these open houses. The universities are touting their own diversity. Um, and by the way, universities have fought hard for programs like affirmative action. Um, to maintain that diversity. And there's, edu and there's research behind their arguments. So if you ever read any of the court documents that the universities put forth, the amicus briefs that support their cases, and look at the footnotes. Just look at the research evidence behind what they're saying. Okay, And they're arguing that there is an educational benefit to diverse classrooms and diverse universities. And we'll talk more about that. Also, employers say they want workers who can work cooperatively with diverse colleagues, right? As the workforce is becoming more diverse, the last thing an employer wants is someone who doesn't know. Oh, I'm sorry. I have a lot of slides. Okay. Um, they don't want someone who can't work in that environment or can't get along with other people who maybe see the world differently or have different life experiences. That's the last thing employers want right now. They're all saying that. The employers, Fortune 500 companies, supported the universities in their fight to keep affirmative action for this very reason, OK? Oops, wait, can you go back? I think I did. Yes, culture of honor. Yes, OK, good. All right, the other reason why this should be a good moment for educational diversity is that we're seeing migration patterns in our metro areas, right? People are moving from suburbs to cities and cities to suburbs. There's a lot of change going on in where people are living in this country. We call it metro migrations. Um, some people call it trading places. There's a lot of, of change in movement. So we're seeing these communities in both in suburban contexts and then in urban gentrifying contexts where there is at least momentarily diversity in terms of who's living in those communities and who would be sending their children to those schools. Um, so we're seeing more diverse communities since any time in the 1920s. But they, we also have learned from the research that these communities are very unstable and fragile. So what is it about that? What is it about this country that can't maintain that diversity in a community and in a school? So we see patterns of whoops, sorry, take, <laughs> patterns of resegregation are starting to appear as low-income families move into suburbs. We've been doing some research on Long Island where we've seen that happen again and again. Um, and then in gentrifying communities, low-income families are being displaced and pushed out, which is a lot about the housing. Um, the development and the, and the housing property values. 
So what I think the challenge then is if these communities are, are more unstable and resegregation is occurring, the challenge really for this nation as we become more diverse is to figure out how to maintain that stability. And any of us could really probably imagine that main, maintaining diversity in a community is related to maintaining diversity in public schools, right? Because there is that tight relationship between schools and communities. So why is there more segregation? When we have metro migration, we have changing demographics, the urban contexts are hip. A lot of people say they're hip because they're more diverse. Um, and we have improved racial attitudes. All of this should add up to more racially um, and ethnically diverse communities and stable, good public schools. So I think we have to be cognizant of the larger context in which these local communities are functioning. One of the things we've done is looked at um, changes in kind of the white supremacist movements, not only in nationalist movements, not only in the US, but also in, in European contexts where we see um, changing demographics in many of the European countries that used to be go ahead, that used to be predominantly white. And we see a rise in nationalist parties. So some of us may see some relationship to what's happened in this country in the last two years. I'm not going to name any names. But um, there's, when they see growing diversity, there's a perceived threat to the national identity. So the way there's actually been a lot of good research on this in the European context and something we ought to be reading about and thinking about more in the US, right? um, is that what happens when, say, Im when immigrants move into countries of different racial ethnic backgrounds in a European context, um, places like Norway, just saying, um, to pick one country, right? So they see a decline in interpersonal trust within that society. Um, they're seeing in-group favoritism, more of this in-group versus out-group idea, perception of competition between groups, um, and resist collective endeavors to support communities or institutions like schools, and work against the commitment to care, community, and the collective. So that's documented in a lot of research going back 10, 15 years in the, in the European context in particular. We need to be doing more of that kind of work in the US, and we need to think about how does that kind of research apply to the current era we're living in right now. Because the argument is the more diverse a society, the more difficult it is to hold it together. Okay, and that should be a big concern to us in the US um, as a democracy. Can we be a democracy that holds together? And an important factor in that would be sustaining public institutions like public schools. So particularly in the US context, we call it something that's called American exceptionalism. While other countries in the European context supported more social welfare policies, socialized medicine, other kinds of policies, in the US we put most of our public support into public education. So that means as a result that when the public starts to fall apart, the sense of the collective, right, public schools are going to be feeling that pretty strongly. Okay, so if we can't work together because we're diverse, we have in-groups, out-groups, we can't be one, we can't be one society, public schools are going to feel that, right? There'll be less support for public education, more parents pulling their kids out of public schools because they don't want their kids with those kids, right? I don't want to be with those parents, I'm this kind of parent, right? So we have to work at that. It's not easy. We need a curriculum for it, and we need a social movement around it, really. So again, that will, um, it will most strongly impact in the US when we think about that pulling apart. It's going to most strongly um, hurt the one public institution we have supported the most in this country, and that's public education. So we see a rise in the, role, in the number of charter schools across the country. You can go on. Uh, increase in um, the clo public school closures, dipping a little bit, but then taking off after 2014. So we're closing public schools. Certainly in New York City, we're closing public schools. In Chicago, we're closing public schools. We're privatizing. We're moving towards charters. With the new tax bill, we might even be moving towards this form of voucherizing um, our tax deductions, shifting the, the money from the public into the private. OK, the other thing we really need to grapple with, and I think it's very appropriate to think about for um, parent university, is there's a paradox. So my, my peers who are saying, why aren't you putting your kid in the gifted school, are part of this what I call the white parent paradox. 
And we just got to be honest, white parents, we have a paradox. So um, particularly well-educated white parents, we embrace diversity as a concept, but we don't often make the choices to, to be in diverse communities or diverse schools. Just, it's true. There's data on it. I'll show you. So you start to measure the attitudes, right? And particularly every survey, every opinion poll shows the higher level of education for white parents, for whites in general, the more white people support diversity and support living in integrated communities, in theory, on the opinion poll data. Okay, but then when you actually look at school choices, they don't do that. Okay, so there's something happening there. It's a mismatch, right, between what parents say and maybe even our intuition about what might be really good for our kids long term. Because I know when I interview white parents whose kids are in segregated white schools, they're like uncomfortable that they're not really preparing their child for the 21st century. So there's something going on here. And we've been doing a lot of research on these fears. Um, and a lot of it comes back to perceptions of schools and the status of schools, the reputation of schools. And we also know that there's a lot of relationship between the race of the children in a school and that perception and that reputation. Now that's not fair if you're not actually going into a school, right? If you're not really seeing what's going on and if you're not valuing um, diversity at a deep level, meaning that how can my kids learn about something different than what our family is, right? Because that's good for them, okay? So there's fear about status, which is really just fear about perception and reputation, but you can't make that choice unless you actually go into the school, see the school, talk to the teacher, talk to the principal, know what's happening in that school, what kind of community is that school. But what happens is, and there's a lot of research on this, particularly white, well-educated parents, but most parents have social networks, okay? Social networks, the higher status you are, meaning the, the white people in this country have higher status. We just do. We have to admit it as part of our white privilege. We also, if you're, if you're highly educated, high income, and white, you're in the highest status. There's a status hierarchy. We just have to admit that, okay? We didn't, we didn't create it. It came before us. So but we're part of it, and we're aware of it, whether we admit it or not. And so we're very conscious of our status, and we want to maintain that status for our kids because it's benefited white parents in a lot of ways, right? So we have social networks that try to push us towards that status and those status indicators. So my example of my peers in New York City is a really good example of that. The social network that I was part of would have pushed me away from the school that I chose. And parents are very conscious of that. There were some parents who insinuated I was a bad parent because I wasn't making the gifted choice. So I lost some friends because we didn't go to the gifted school, right? So it's hard. I mean, there's status issues, and people look at you sometimes like you're making the wrong choice. But you have to do, A, what's good for your own child, and B, what's good for the society, OK? And oftentimes, those are the same. Um, so what happens is with these fears is that they're choosing segregation over integration, lobbying for separate and unequal classes within racially diverse, diverse schools. Sometimes, sometimes parents get into these diverse schools but then want their kid in a separate space within them with a, with a title, gifted and talented, truly exceptional. <laughs> and we all know all our kids are really exceptional. So. Um, so this is just a quote from some of the research. On average, the greater education the white parents, the greater likelihood that they'll respond to a high percentage of black children. Um, this was done a statistical survey um, so in the surrounding area by removing their children from the assigned public school. So there's, that's really odd. So you see the, the racial attitudes are quote unquote better with these high educated parents, but the actions work in another direction. So we have to grapple with that. We have to grapple with that as a society, right? So I'm going to skip through this part a little quickly. This is kind of the history of, um, this talks a lot about the education policies that push the schools towards segregation and influence the parents, right? The, the, the testing that we do. 
So testing, if you read the research on that, now I'm not saying there aren't, there's no value in, in testing kids to see if they know math and, and certain things, but testing is very culturally biased, okay? So white kids and Asian kids generally do better on these tests. And they've actually done experiments where they come up with tests that black kids do better on because it's a different set of questions, a different orientation, right? So if we think our kids are genius just because they're doing well on these tests, you know, we ought to see what they do on the other tests, right? So yeah, our kids are smart, but there is a cultural context to that, right? And so just judging schools by test scores, the other thing is there's a very high correlation between parents' education and kids' test scores. So you put kids with high test scores because they're white, because they're middle class, because their mother's educated, um, and you put them in a school with lower test scores, they're still going to get high test scores because they know how to do that. They know how to answer those questions. Okay? So that's not to say the schools don't have any impact on test scores. But, they, but there are other, there's a lot of research really on what, what's being tested. Okay? So that's why when you look at a school, please go beyond the test scores, right? Please, 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 right? And think about your child and think about that school environment. So this is just to show you how in the K through 12 system, we've really pushed the system to be more segregated. In the higher education system where I work, we've tried to embrace the concept of diversity, um, at least in terms of the admissions. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, we're doing more at the college level, at least some of us, around our curriculum, around our pedagogy, because our student population is much more diverse than our faculty. So really K through 12 and higher ed should be working together. Right? Parents say they're putting their kid in segregated gifted programs because they want them to get into these very elite universities, but the very elite universities are trying to embrace this diversity and work on curriculum that supports it. So there's a mismatch here. So this is my favorite gentrification bingo. As I've said, we spend a lot of time in Brooklyn, on the western side of Brooklyn. Um, so it seems quite evident that racially diverse communities in public schools are fragile, unstable, and in the process of resegregating and being closed down and replaced by privately managed options. So, I mean, this requires, we can, we can depending on your politics, we can hem and aha about what's happening in Washington, D.C. or whatever. And, um, but this requires us to work at the local level, at the community level and to really grapple with some difficult issues, right, and to work together. And to really think about what is a good school, right, beyond the test scores. So, um, what can we do? So, we're going to look just quickly at the research. Some of this is very historical about how when we first did desegregation, we didn't do it very well in this country. Did anyone go to, was anyone part of a desegregation plan in the 70s or 80s or... Well, there's a, there was, as you know, a lot of school desegregation plans in this country, but we also learned a lot from the research about, well, things that we could have done better when we did that that I think could be very helpful moving forward in terms of creating racially diverse schools. So we know that separate's unequal. Go quickly through these. So we know why, because um, segregated schools with predominantly black and Latino students tend to have high concentrations of poverty. There's certain factors that come out in the research which is, again, a lot about that issue of how they're perceived, how those schools are perceived, and which teachers choose to work there, um, and the choices that are made, and then the expectations how the students are perceived sometimes in those schools, okay? So high concentrated poverty is not good, and uh, segregation. Um, and then we also know that when we desegregated, there were very high academic outcomes for all students. So, so white students who are high achieving we're not disadvantaged in desegregated schools. The research shows that. We also saw the achievement gap close, not because the white scores went down, but because black and Latino scores increased. Um, and it happened more during this era of desegregation. Um, and that there were long-term effects for all students. So the research also shows that students who did go to desegregated schools in this country, and I've studied a lot of them, came out with better racial attitudes and more comfort in diverse settings, okay? Which we have more of those now because we're a more diverse society. Um, oh, that was this one. Improve racial attitudes and increase comfort. And there were long-term outcomes related to mobility. That I think. 
Okay, but what wasn't done the first time we desegregated, we didn't really work on school curriculum and the sociocultural issues, which relates very much to parents um, as well, what parents wanted in the school. Um, black teachers were fired and black schools were closed, which we learn now there was actually a lot of interesting pedagogy going on in curriculum in those schools. And black and Hispanic students were sent to predominantly white schools where teachers were told they should not talk about race. So not talking about race in a racially diverse school is not a good idea, okay? Right, because students are like experiencing race, right? They, I mean, we say they're colorblind, they're not, and neither are we. So let's just be honest, we're not colorblind. So we need to talk about race. The adults in the school need to talk about race, right? They need to make students feel comfortable talking about race and racial difference, okay? Um, and we emphasize, so this is just some of the educators who said they weren't emphasizing race back in the 70s and 80s, 1970s and 80s. Um, a lot of educators thought they weren't supposed to do that. They didn't change the curriculum. This is one of my favorite quotes, doing teaching the dead white men for a long, long time. So if you're desegregating a school, you have a very racially diverse school and classroom, and you're just teaching this curriculum of dead white men. I mean, that's just, we know that in the university, that doesn't work anymore, right? So we need to switch it up. Um, and then there were these second generation issues, hence my password and my checking account. Right, so we resegregated students into separate and unequal, either gifted programs within schools. There are schools in New York City you can tour, and all the white kids are on this side of the hall, and all the students of color are on the other side, because this is the gifted side. Yeah, it's bad. Um, <laughs> so we, we either create septic, sec, separate gifted schools or separate gifted classrooms within schools. Um, and then there's disproportionality in terms of punishment. You can imagine if you were a student of color in a school where you're just reading about dead white men and no one's talking about race and no one's valuing what you're bringing to school, it could lead to some problems with discipline um, and denial of bilingual services. So that's our history of when we try to desegregate. There's a lot of things we didn't do that we could do moving forward, but we need parent support to do it. So these are some of the benefits that your children can achieve through, through um, more integrated, diverse schools. And this comes through, this is in this report that we sent along that you probably have access to. It's an interdisciplinary body of research from brain science. Brain science is really interesting now. It's really developing quickly on how we learn and how children learn and, and child development. Um, it's social psychological work on interracial understanding, on implicit biases. So what we're seeing is that if you're in a classroom setting and the, and the curriculum set up so that you're learning from your classmates, you're learning things better and deeper because you're being challenged on your assumptions if somebody doesn't see it the way you see it. I mean, just think about that as an adult. Do you learn more from people who see the world exactly the way you do or do you learn more from people who see it differently, right? When your own assumptions are challenged, you have to think deeply about what you believe. And you may not change your mind, but you have to think about it harder, right? More critical thinking skills. Um, it actually shows up in brain research. So we also increase, we increase intercultural awareness, cross-cultural understanding and knowledge, um, which helps you if you're going to go on in, in most jobs in this um, society where you have to interact with people of different racial ethnic backgrounds. You have people working for trans-global corporations that are in different countries every week. Um, and the one that I love is the increased democratic outcomes. So this goes back to what we were talking about before with the European countries. Um, if, you're in, if you're learning and growing and developing in a school that's diverse, and you're learning more about people who are different from you, you have a different sense of the collective, of the society, of your civil society and you're gonna be more engaged in that society as it becomes more diverse. Okay, so that's something we really need to think about in a democratic country that's becoming more diverse. How do we create citizens for the 21st century? How do we help kids become more engaged? Um, and how do we help students kind of grow up to learn to love their neighbor even if their neighbor doesn't look like them? And to care for each other, right? Without this in-group, out-group thing. It's not going to happen in racially segregated schools. So again, you enhance learning and social and emotional development. You re reduce implicit bias. I don't know if anyone's taken the implicit bias test um, that's online. Just Google it. You can find it. 
right? So we have implicit biases that relate to race. They show that actually when you see um, a, a darker skinned person, white people are more likely to assume that person is bad. Um, so these implicit biases that have grown up in our brains over time, right? We just have to admit that we have them. Most people have them. Take the test. You may have them. Um, but what the way to undo those in your brain is to have enough interaction with people of color, people who you may have biases about, to understand and undo the biases. And what they've actually learned through cognitive science is that when you do away with your own bias, you actually learn better. Because you're less worried, right? You're less fearful. You're less afraid of the other. You're more open. You're more engaging. So getting rid of implicit bias for white people is a really good thing. So I think we should all work on it. And it also, if you're the victim of a bias, it's a good thing to have it reduced, right? So, solutions. So in order to get the public more engaged around diverse schools, to get more support to kind of deal with these issues of status and reputation, this is the good school over there. This is the bad school over there. And oh, by the way, the school's all white and the school's all students of color. In order to get past that, we're going to have to think more broadly about what a good school is. And what I've learned from my research is that when I interview parents and I talk to them about what they care about, when I ask them what they're basing their choices on, they'll often talk about test scores. When I ask them what they care about, they don't talk about test scores. What they, what they want their kid to experience every day, they want their kids to be loved and cared for. They want them to be nurtured. They want their social emotional development to be taken care of because you can't learn cognitively if you don't have that, if you don't feel safe, if you don't feel secured, if you don't feel loved, right? If you don't feel that what you bring to school is valued as a child, and your experiences are valued, you're not going to learn math as well, at least. Okay? So there's research on that. If you think every parent knows a kid has social, emotional, and cognitive growth, right? If we only focus on cognitive, it's going to fall apart. They're whole units, right? These kids, they're not like one piece. They're not just the brain, right? They're not just the cognitive. We need to really nurture the whole child. And you know what? When you do that, it's going to help the brain. So this being in a school that's open and accepting to students of different racial and ethnic backgrounds is a warm environment and an accepting environment for all children. And then creating school classroom curriculum and experiences where they can learn from each other will challenge kids to learn more and learn better and learn deeper. Okay? So I'm just going to show a quick video, if we have time, of, an, of this institute that we do at Teachers College where you'll see teachers working on this. And these are some national experts. I'm here to tell you today that this is not only a journey to reinvent school desegregation policies, but we are on a journey to reimagine education itself. The 2017 Reimagining Education Summer Institute was held at Teachers College, Columbia University, bringing together teachers, graduate students, student activists, principals, and other school leaders. With Teachers College faculty and national experts, they engaged in deep discussions, built professional skills, and shared insights on their practices. Children aren't robots, they're people, they come with a context. If you don't know that kid, you can't teach them. How do we get on with one another? How do we teach friendship? How do we teach kindness? How do we develop active listening skills? How do we learn how to speak even when we're disagreeing out of love? How was I supposed to make history interesting to my students? How can I help them see the way their culture is shaped by history and question whose stories are being told? Most poor children, many of whom are children of color, have never been afforded equal access to the type of education provided to middle class and wealthy white children. A historical literacy must be accompanied by humility. A willing, did somebody say yes, ma'am? Yes. 
the Reimagining Education participants work together to create more caring and engaging schools for today's racially and ethnically diverse students. The feeling of inclusivity was very abnormal to me and I didn't understand why. After further research, after reading a lot, I realized it was because New York City has the most segregated schools in the country. Taking up the charge of fighting for a better and more equitable world is a call for each and every one of us to set our pedagogies on fire. Step the hell out of what you've been doing to go find a connection somewhere where you're scared to go. Go into that space and identify something that makes you uncomfortable and you're going to utilize as an anchor for your pedagogy. What a treat this has been, Ali. We hope you will join us next summer. That's the kind of thing that educators who want to do this work really well are working on. We have another project that I'm, I don't have a ton of time to talk about, but we're, where we are working with parents. Um, we're forefronting engagement with parents um, with some research and trying to understand parents' fears around race or concerns around racial diversity in schools. And then we're bringing parents together to talk about that. Um, and there's just a couple slides at the end. Let's go on. That's the public good. That's our project. Um, and then we do strategic communications to help support the public schools. We provide professional development for teachers, and we work with parents to help them um, kind of learn from each other. And we're now using the student work in the classroom together to bring the parents together to learn about different communities, cultures, and understanding. So I just want to congratulate you on being in a diverse school district. Your kids will benefit from it, and thank you for having me. So. I now invite the, uh, our alumni to the table here. I ask our alumni to um, talk, about, talk about their experience going to a diverse Portland Public Schools and how that diversity has impacted their post-secondary education and their careers right now. So um, I want the, the description of their, their brief bi uh, biographies on the program, and I just want them to introduce themselves briefly and then respond to the prompt that I gave them. Okay, and I gave them three to five minutes to talk about it. Each. Should we do interest first, and then? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm a living white man. Uh, I'm Will Nelligan. I'm a graduate of King Middle School and Casco Bay High School. Uh, this is so cool. This is so cool. Thank you so much, Javier and Grace, for, for including me in this session. My mom and dad are in the room, and I know they would be here if they were parents rather than parents emeriti. Um, uh, introductory. Uh, so I work at a place called the Jane Institute. We're a think tank that's focused on accelerating the progress of transformative ideas in the social sciences. Before that, I worked at the Robin Hood Foundation, which is the largest poverty-fighting uh, organization in America. And I started out my career working in the United States Senate for Tom Harkin, uh, who is a Democrat from Iowa. Um, so great to be here, and I look forward to the dialogue. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Marian Isaac, um, and I'm a Deering High School grad. I graduated 2016. Um, and I've been to Lyman Moore and Prism Scott, so I've been in, um, in the Portland Public Schooling my whole life. Um, I currently go to USM and I'm a second year studying health sciences with a minor in holistic and integrative health, and I'm happy to be here as well. Um, hello everyone, uh, my name is Malcolm Arthur Henry, and uh, I am the small bio person, if you're uh, reading a little pamphlet. Um, just look for what looks like a, it could be describing a picture in a National Geographic film, um, amount of writing. I, uh, I come from um, a family that is half Jamaican, um, half uh, rural Maine. Um, and that's very, uh, it's definitely been a very interesting experience. I went to, um, Farmington, the University of Farmington, University of Maine, Farmington. Um, and uh, I went there for a year, and then I 
started doing freelance moving, and um, if you need a, someone to move your furniture, you can talk to me later. Um, <laughs> but I'm very real about it. I'm very real. Um, I think that um, I am probably a, a good person to speak here today because um, I, I have worked in a place um, where I was the only person of color pretty much every single time that I have worked at a place. Um, and uh, that is essentially the future um, for the people who are the diversify ease, if that makes any sense. Essentially the people being, being, the people doing the diversifying, people of color who are in white spaces. Um, and I think that's uh, something that we need to talk about more. And I woke up this morning, even though it was my day off, to go to a white space and make a little extra money and then come here. So I'm a little tired, but I'm ready to talk, and I'm really excited that we're doing this in general. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm Damien. I went to Nathan Clifford and then King Middle and then Portland High. Um, <clears throat> since then, um, I you know left the state, went to college, decided... I need to come back, I love this state. Um, one of the things I often hear from people um, having, having gone out and then come back is like, oh, why go back to Maine? It's not very diverse, which is sort of true. Um, but I, I like to remember Portland and the experiences that I had in the public school district. And um, it's, it's the right place for me. Um, right now I work with a nonprofit based out of Cambridge in Massachusetts called the Central Partners and what we do is train communities how to have conversations across difference. So it could be political difference, racial difference, ideological difference. We kind of acknowledge that the tools you need in order to have productive civil conversations with people you disagree with or don't understand is something you need to learn and practice. So we like to be that resource. Um, and a lot of the work that we do there and the reason I went there is sort of fueled by the experiences I had in the, in the school district here. So glad to be here. My name is Stephanie Trace Gill. I'm um, back here after 18 years in New York City. And I went to Hall um, back in the 70s. So it tells me my age. And um, then Lincoln and Deering. And I can't imagine my life without it. So uh, that's my intro. Um, and I should also mention, I. Well, anyway, we'll talk later. So the question that was posed uh, to the panel is, how did that experience of diversity in Portland public schools help them in their career? And we have three to five minutes, so I'm going to be like giving you a sign. Uh, so I always say, even when a lot of my former teachers aren't in the room like they are now, that the most valuable diploma I have is the diploma I got from King Middle School. Um, and, you know, I think the reason that I say that is, is uh, for a lot of what Amy touched on. Um, the value of, of existing in a diverse educational environment like the Portland Public Schools, like King, was both in seeing sameness where there wasn't obviously that looking at a child who didn't look like me, have a home like mine, speak a language like mine, and seeing in, the, in, in that child the same uh, ambitions, fears, anxieties, interests, passions. Um, there are too few spaces like that in America today, and, and the evidence of that fact is, goes without saying everywhere apparent, um, in our politics especially. So on the one hand, seeing that sameness where it wasn't immediately evident, but also seeing difference and understanding it, appreciating it, internalizing it, respecting it. Um, in, in my job now and in jobs I've had previously, uh, I travel all around the world and interact with people from lots of different cultures. And having a sense of, of that is significant for me professionally. Um, uh, and has really, I think, formed a lot of the professional identity I have and the interest that I have. Being at King in the environment that I was in, seeing the, the, the my fellow classmates uh, and, and the variety of experiences they brought into that classroom and then went home to at the end of the day, it was the first time I thought about what is the only through line in a uh, sort of bizarrely rich and varied career, which is social justice. Um, and I, I think the, the sort of cornerstone of my professional identity was formed in those classrooms uh, because of the people who were sitting alongside me and how 
varied and diverse their experiences were. Um, for me, diversity, I feel like it's not only, um, you know, embracing the people around you, but also embracing your own culture as a person of color. As a young child, I feel like when I was young, I didn't really have like a, you know, true, um, a true like self, um, strong self-esteem. You know, I kind of was like, oh, I, I want straighter hair, you know, I want lighter skin, I want to look like her, you know, because, you know, that was mainly kind of what every, you know, as a young person, you're you know, very influential, um, and you want to be what, the, what everyone else is, and I was um, always like, oh, I want, I, want, I want to look at her, you know, I want the blonde hair, I want the blue eyes, and just being in, like, um, a classroom, you know, like, most of my life, you know, with white counterparts, um, I always wanted to kind of just have that, you know, self-image, but later on, as I went to high school, middle school, like, it taught me to, like, really love myself, love my culture, you know, learn more about my culture, get in touch with my roots, and, um, you know, teach others how to love themselves, you know, for their, you know, in their own culture, and just embrace that value, and grow up, and kind of continue that cycle of teaching, you know, kids of color, or different nationalities, to really love themselves, and be happy with their diversity and be happy with their self-image and everything. And also, you know, learn as a person of color how to defend yourself, you know, in situations of, you know, when you're getting racially attacked or verbally attacked because of how you look, how, you know, how you speak, where you're from. It really taught me, you know, how to counteract that. And also, I got to really teach people who were very close-minded, you know, of people of different cultures and languages to really learn and how diversity helps later on. And you're gonna be like with diverse, you know, audiences and everything, you know, in college and everything uh, as you continue. And recently, um, I, we had an event um, at the USM campus. It's called the People of Color Party. And so we got a lot of backlash from that because a lot of people are like, oh, it's a people of color party. So whites and other, you know, people non, of non, you know, people of color are not allowed to come, and there was just assumptions and everything, and I feel like it's so quick to assume, but without you know communicating with people and even going to the event and be like, hey, am I allowed to be in this space? And I just saw that as a sign of people, you know, um, white people within my community at USM, like being so against having spaces for people of color to really embrace, you know, their diversity and be able to talk to each other and be able to connect and relate. And I just think it's important to really value and allow people of color to have spaces where they can communicate and where they can connect outside of, you know, classrooms where there's a lot of their white counterparts. So I really feel like diversity is important and communication and everything else. Because as we continue on, you know, with life, I feel like the um, geographical, you know, demographic and everything, we are becoming mixed, you know, like mixed cultures, you know, mixed races, and I think it's important to continue to value that. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so I kind of even want to talk a little bit more about that. Um, uh, I've, I've, uh, I've been in spaces where um, people, like you said, you had this uh, colored people party. Um, I've been in spaces where people of color have made an attempt to get together and um, white people in that space sort of assume that they're excluded. And I think what is really important, it's, uh, it's maybe a little nuanced, but it's very important to make this clear, um, that is not a threat to you. That is people trying to come together and feel a little more comfortable. Um, <clears throat> and I want to talk about uh, my own experience sort of on either side of this, uh, this diversity coin, if you will. Um, the first story I'm going to tell you is about me uh, in college, and then I'm going to bring it back. In college at the University of Farmington, I was having what you would call a so-so time. Um, it was kind of fun some nights. Um, most of the time, I was very tired, very stressed out, uh, very disinterested. And, um, and I would think to myself a lot, There's, I mean, 
there must be a way to make this place work. Um, and before I really had any um, developments in that area, uh, my grandfather died. And um, I uh, spent a very interesting week before uh, Halloween talking to um, lots of white students about uh, Halloween, they would say, what's the Halloween plan, Malcolm? What are you doing? And I was like, I'm going to Jamaica. They're like, what? Um, and I'm like, yeah, I'm going to my grandfather's funeral. And you see their face fall. It's like, oh. But then the very next thing out of their mouths is, but Jamaica, yay. And there's, there's a little bit of a nuance there that a lot of people don't pay attention to because I, was, I wasn't excited to go to a tropical locale I, was, I would have gladly gone to Jamaica for a much better reason. It is a beautiful place with a lot of poverty, very intense. Um, and I would prefer to go there to see my family, not to see off my family. Um, that being said, the experience of coming back from there was even more alienating because I had just been in a place where there are mostly Jamaican, in Jamaica, mostly Jamaican people. I don't know if you people know that. Um, but <laughs> it's, it's mostly people of color. Um, and then coming into the woods of Maine um, to try to develop an identity, which is what college is. Let's, let's make that plain and simple. That's where you develop your identity. And then maybe you'll get a degree that hopefully does not completely bankrupt you, hopefully. Um, but um, I wanted to tell you this story, and the second story I want to tell you um, is uh, about someone who I grew up with named Zach Knorr. Um, he is uh, from, from Canada, but his family is from Somalia, um, and they moved to Canada and then moved to Maine. Um, I called him Zach. Um, that wasn't his Somalian name, but I've been told that I've never been able to say that right, so I'm not going to try. Um, he was one of the biggest parts of my life, um, and I didn't even, as a child, notice the divide coming between us. Because when you spend time in white spaces, and you want to be a part of those white spaces, your inclination is to sort of adapt. So what do you do when you're in a room full of people who are not like you, children who haven't necessarily been educated to be very accepting of each other? You become very scrutinizing. You become a little bit of a, uh, uh, just a, just a, a negative presence. Um, there, there is a negative culture around the way children interact now. There's a lot of uh, teasing, a lot of poking. And I'm not going to say that that doesn't sort of help for how you socialize on a sort of like whimsical level going forward. But at the same time, it's very hurtful at a very, very young age. And it got to the point where his mother actually wanted me to not spend time with him anymore. And this is after our families have been together this whole time. And this whole time, she didn't want to talk to me personally about it because she probably, like, correctly assumed that I didn't know where she was coming from because she thought that... And this is kind of a good assumption that I, as a person not coming from another country, wouldn't know what it's like to be alienated and feel like your culture is sort of being poked fun at. Um, and it's important that you hear the nuance in this story, too, because this, is, this second story seems like it's a story about me, but I'd like you to switch your perspective for a sec. Um, think about this story as a story about Zach, um, because Zach, as, as, as someone in a white space, as a person of color, from a different country, albeit it's Canada, but still his whole family, um, he, his very best friend, the person who we saw every day, was making him feel that way and making his mother feel that way. That's me in this story. Um, and I didn't know it. And the only way that I could mend that was to talk to them and be sincere and say, I sincerely want to 
make a change in the way that we interact for both of our benefits. And what I want you guys to take away from this is that um, we need to be careful in the way that we tell these stories. We need to make sure that we're talking about people in these spaces um, instead of talking about us and how we benefit from it. Because ultimately what we're all trying to work for is being in a place where we all feel comfortable. And I think that we need to focus on each other if we're going to do that. Ed, there you go. You good. <laughs> Um, so I think um, probably the, the broadest possible thing I could say about how my experience with diversity at the school district sort of informed my life trajectory is that it, it sort of set me up to have a presupposition that I should be around people not like me, that it would, it, it, in a way it almost set it up as like an unchecked assumption that I would go into the world and think like, right, yeah, I should be around people who aren't like me because otherwise, like how do I, how do I avoid this, this sort of otherization of people that I don't understand or might not have exposure to? And um, I think recently in the, just sort of the political landscape that we're in now, you can see pretty blatantly the effects of what happens when you don't have that exposure to people that aren't like you. So you, you are so much, you are so set up to have the assumptions that you're hearing from media, in your bubbles, other people in your life that, that also haven't had that sort of exposure, you're set up to rely on stereotypes or assumptions to inform you about they, or people who aren't like you. And um, it wouldn't be such a horrible thing if you didn't also live in a democracy where you then vote on policies that affect everybody. Um, so I, th I think coming from, even as, especially in your formative years, coming from an environment where you know, there are people who don't look just like you, who don't just think like you, who don't have the same faith as you, um, as just something that doesn't necessarily strike you as like, wait, not all these people are like me. You just kind of grow into it in a way um, that it makes you notice it later on in life when it's not there. Um, so coming through the recent elections, and seeing, not that this was the first time this happened, obviously, in this country, but um, coming through the most recent elections and, and looking at how much of the discourse in this country and in our pockets, in our bubbles, in our tribes, um, is informed by a lack of awareness, um, or disinformed, I should say, by a, by a lack of awareness and a lack of exposure to people that aren't like us. It's just, it drives it home every single time repeatedly. Um, so I think I, I wish more people sort of had that exposure early on in life so that when you're in a situation where, like, oh, these people do this or these people believe that, your first instinct isn't to go like, yeah, those people. It's, it's to go like, uh, I've met people who were a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. And the one thing I've learned is you can't put anybody in baskets like that. Um, it, it just doesn't work. So I think sort of having that always be a goal in my life or like noticing when like I'm just surrounded by people who are like me, I don't feel like I'm learning anything. I don't feel like um, even, even the sort of conflicts that come up because of diversity, it's not necessarily a bad thing to have some kind of a conflict or a difference. It can be generative, it can bring new ideas, just the clashes between different ideologies can produce something new. So um, I think the trick to is not just the exposure to people who aren't like you, but having the resources and the skills that you build over time to learn how to talk about those differences. Um, just being in a place with people who aren't like you isn't good enough. Like you have to, it's a life skill that you build over time, learning how to relate, how to ask questions about difference in a way that doesn't set you up to just be like, why are you like that? But like showing some genuine curiosity and then having the tools to talk about it in a way that produces some kind of an outcome where people can feel they relate and build trust and that they're less likely than to act on some kind of an assumption about, oh, you're like that. Um, and I've actually seen a lot of this <laughs> in um, my community of other progressive white people. Um, there's a lot of assumption that I see, and now I'm talking mainly about like ideological difference, but it's a form of diversity. Um, and it sort of relates back to the same need to communicate. 
but a lot of assumption of like, oh, all these Trump voters are like this, all these people are like that. And I just see it's the same extension of like, I'm not willing to give this person any, any credit of, or any, to show them any curiosity around like, I wanna know why you think the way you do or why this is a value of yours. Um, so I really think it all comes down to some form of exposure and communication. And I was really lucky to be, um, if I was going to be in one of the whitest states in the country, really lucky to be in the Portland area <laughs> where there was, where there was um, so many people not like me that I could learn from and be friends with and relate to. Um, and now it's, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely pushed me in a trajectory of thinking like, okay, great. It's, we know it's good to be surrounded by people who are different, but then the added challenge is how do you... Um, how do you cultivate relationships with people across any kind of difference, whether it's racial, ideological, religious? Um, so that's sort of driven me to where I am now. And uh, I, I really have the, <laughs> the Portland district to thank for that. Well, um, <clears throat> I just want to go back to 1975 in Portland. Um, starting at Hall School, um, you almost never heard a language other than English being spoken back then. <clears throat> but you did have a lot of diversity. Um, we lived uh, on Dorset Street, a block away from Hall, and um, noticed at a very young age that if you lived one block in the other direction, you were more likely to be brought to the principal's office once or twice a week. And if you, uh, although very few kids had, were darker skin, if they had dark skin, they were much more likely to be brought to the principal's office once or twice a week. Um, whereas I was never brought to the principal's office. Hmm. And I, I no, remember noticing diversity from a very young age, but, not, so, but in that context. And if I hadn't gone to Hall, I don't know how long it would have taken me to start asking questions about social justice and about racial and economic equ equity. Um, so um, when Lincoln and um, when I went on to Lincoln and Deering, there was a little bit more growth in um, diversity. And because we were in Portland, we were part of that diversity, not so much through the school initially, but because the first refugees' families came from Vietnam, and two of them stayed in our home, and it was like, wow, my world turned upside down. There was a family sitting in our kitchen, cooking on the floor, speaking a language I didn't understand, so we were immersed in their culture, and it just like hit me at the age of five, which is, wow, like this is the world. Like I had no idea any of this existed. It was this amazing, life-changing experience that turned me into who I am today. Um, so being in Portland made that possible. Um, uh, so I, from a very young age, said I need to learn languages, this is it. And the Portland Public Schools made that possible. Um, from learning um, French all the way back in Lincoln to uh, uh, Latin and then um, skipping chemistry class to go to Chinese classes when they started offering them and finally going to my professor, Mrs. Dominic, and saying, Mrs. Dominic, I actually skipped class, and I don't want to do it, I don't want to lie, but please let me miss class once a week. I had seven periods with her, and I hated chemistry. I said, just let me go once a week for Chinese, and I'll make up everything. She said, okay, okay. So, um, I, uh, you know, that was a great experience, and um, thank God I had that experience at Deering, because if I didn't, when I went to Wesleyan, same school that Damien went to, I'm not a big fan of Wesleyan, but one, I would say that, um, so please tell your children, talk to me if they're thinking about going. But, um, or, real, or to him, thanks. Um, yeah, I have ex-friends who have gone to Wesleyan. We have a lot of dirt on Wesleyan. But, um, the, um, but what I'd say is, um, the, uh, ha going to Wesleyan was a culture shock. One quarter of the students were New York, mostly New York white students very different culture, and then the others were my, racial minorities. So if, it was a huge culture shock for me, mainly the New Yorkers, but particularly um, realizing how different the world was for most people in school. The rules were completely different. I mean, if you didn't get diversity, you were not going to make it at Wesleyan. And so, I mean, I, I got it, it but it, it would have been really hard if I hadn't been in the Portland schools, if I had been in a list less diverse school district. I can't imagine. From there I moved on to New York City where it was about 50% racial minorities in the context where I worked. I worked in the context of immigrant rights, doing a lot of work um, on all different issues and ultimately focusing on language access in the public hospitals where I was hired to overhaul um, the New York City public hospitals language access programs. 
And um, so the language base I got at Deering brought me the chance to learn additional languages, including Mandarin and Spanish and Portuguese. Through friendships I made at Wesleyan, through, and then be able to use those jobs. That was basically why I got a, a chance of a lifetime to overhaul the public hospitals. They said, we just need someone who speaks the languages they speak in Queens, and you're the only one we found. So even though I had no ex one year of teaching, interpreting badly, they said, we want to give you a, you know, quarter million, a half a million dollar budget to do this and that. And, I said, okay, as long as you give me a carte blanche, I'll take it. And uh, we made a lot of changes, had a got big article on the front page of the Metro section of New York Times saying new, new programs change the face of healthcare. And um, once again, it goes back to what, what I got at Deering and uh, what I got through this education here. So I just want to switch quickly to what it means now to be a mother. So after this experience, I met my husband of my dreams, got married, moved back to, um, and we're figuring out, do we stay in New York? Do we stay in um, Maine? So I took a four-year childcare leave from my job in New York, moved back to Maine just to see what it was like, test the waters. And um, we had a lot of culture shock here. I was afraid of raising a kid in Maine, frankly. I was afraid because I thought, I don't want him to, uh, everyone was saying move to Falmouth. You gotta go to the Falmouth schools, you gotta go to the Cape Elizabeth schools. And I thought, oh my God, if we're gonna live anywhere, it has to be Portland, it has to be the Portland schools. And um, waiting to get into the Portland schools took some time, we looked for immersion programs, we had a Spanish daycare, and an Arabic and French speaking babysitter, but all of those fell through. And at a certain point I was getting worried about my son growing up in the whitest state in the country. And I actually, at the age of four, I sat him down, he was playing computer games, I, and I had him take the implicit bias test for, I wanted to see if my son was growing up racist. I was really worried. And he kind of, after doing this a couple times, he was like, mom, this is not fun. I'm not doing this, mom. Um, but luckily, I didn't have to wait to see how it turned out because I, um, I, he did get into the Portland schools and got into the Spanish immersion program at Lyseth which was a good thing it was started because I was telling my husband, if we don't find an immersion program, we're moving out. We're moving to Boston or New York, I can't take it. So we got him to this program and um, so now, um, you know, not only able, was he able to interpret for his grandma and his father when, they, when we went to Cuba last February, but, um, but also um, he's, uh, in an environment where he's able to greet people in multiple languages and he understands different cultures and when complex things happen in politics, he's not looking at it, um, he's looking at it from a perspective of how does this affect his peers, how does this affect our broader multi, you know, multiracial, multi-religious community. And um, so I would say, and it's part of teaching, you know, I think for kids, part of the education is not just what you know, but it's what we tell him now, it's not just what you know, but it's how you learn to respect different people and it's what you do with what you know and do you make your world a better place? And how can we teach kids how to make the world a better place when, um, when they're not, when they're in a, a bubble? So I think um, being in the Portland schools, it can be, you know, more challenging, it can be more gritty, but it's the real world and it's, it's more fun. And I think um, I'm just very grateful to the Portland Public Schools for all the work um, you've done to keep this tradition going. Thank you. Thank you very much for, um, for our panelists. And now they're all joined by um, Amy for your questions. Hi. Um, I guess I just have a question about, I've heard people say, um, well, I worry about my child not getting their need. You know, there's so much need and not enough resources in a more diverse school. I hear that as kind of like the new way of saying, I don't want to be in the <laughs> diverse school. And so, there's a part of it that in some ways can be true. There are less resources. There are some schools around here that, it, from towns that are much wealthier who do have more resources. So I wonder like, how you fit that into the discussion about the reality of resources and that 
some schools get a lot less than other schools and how we sort of handle that when we're talking about trying to be diverse schools? Yeah, that's a good question. I would, um, first of all, I, I wouldn't just take that comment at face value. I mean, there's, a, and I'm not saying you are, but, but a lot of parents do. But you could, you can actually look at the public funding, right, from the state and see the per pupil funding. So first of all, sometimes people say that and it, it may not be true. Sometimes urban schools have more money than, than suburban schools for title run and different federal programs. Um, and, and look at the teacher-student ratio. So there's a lot of things you really should ask when someone says that as a generalization. And then how are they spending the resources, right? So I think sometimes people say things like that without a lot of knowledge and evidence about it. And so for, that's the first thing is I would look at the, at the evidence on how many resources and look at how the resources are being used. Because my experience in studying many public schools is that public schools use their resources in very different ways. And sometimes these schools with more affluent parents where they're doing a lot of private fundraising, um, they may be using the resources in ways that only benefit some kids and not others. And so um, I, would ask, I would ask really hard questions, like do, some, do a little bit of research. You can ask principals about professional development, about um, student-teacher ratio, about AIDS. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of depth to that, to that question. And then there's the facilities and, and all of that. But, Really, when you think about your child's experience, the most important thing is um, their relationships with the adults and how that fosters relationships with other kids. So I'd rather have my child in a school with a little bit less fancy building or playground, but better relationships among the people within the building. So, and, and this kind of social emotional learning that's so important to their cognitive growth and a faculty that, that understands that and knows that and fosters that and is very intuitive about children and where they are on a certain day, right? We all know what a good teacher is. A teacher is a teacher who knows, knows your child, right? Knows them really well and knows the classroom and makes them feel welcome. So sometimes you find those teachers in less resource schools. So I think you just got to go a little deeper. And resources matter. We know that. And I would never advocate to, that we need less resources in public education. but. Um, but it's also how they're being spent, what the priorities are in that school, and how the teachers are being trained, and how they're, they are interacting with the children and helping children interact with each other. I'm not an English speaker, so I will always speak low. My question is directed to Amy. As a, a parent, you knew the needs of your kids, and uh, you were not really caring about the schools because you know where your I'm, I'm, I share that experience too, but sometimes I just get upset with the school because actually it goes to school. We need good school to make some progress. And uh, what do you advise for parents who have like that feeling of, you know your son or daughter is doing better, but the school is receiving as, you no, know, we are part of the minority and you can still feel it even if they, do, they say it is not, we don't care about being from another place, but you can feel it even with the score because you are the one, you know well your, uh, your child and you, you are not upset about the result or the score. I think, I think number one is again that parent-teacher relationship, I mean that, I'm sorry, that student-teacher relationship and there's just a ton of work on teacher expectations and teachers' belief in children. Um, and that's just number one. And that's the thing you really need to focus on when you're choosing a school for your child. And that's why I think the best teachers are actually teachers who are really good at supporting and sustaining children from very diverse backgrounds because they see the gift in every child, right? And they know how to draw that out. And that's a really good teacher. And those test, test scores in schools like that are going to go up, right? But, you know you have to control for all the cultural biases and other issues related to testing, but test scores in schools like that are gonna go up, where the emphasis is on a teacher development that relates to knowing the whole child, understanding the whole child, and helping take kids from point A to point B in terms of the curriculum. That is part of cognitive development, and that's what we have to think about. So when you go on, if you were able to go on tours for different schools, you wanna watch the student-teacher interaction. How are the adults talking to the children, right? How are they fostering a sense of engagement and care in the classroom? Because that's where children are going to flourish. They're going to take off. They're going to be interested. They're going to be engaged. And they're going to want to do it because somebody believes they can do it. Um, this is just really the heart of child psychology and child development. 
And I think we lose that when we're only looking at test scores or playground equipment or whatever, right? Because I've been on a lot of school tours and parents ask a lot of questions about some of the superficial things, which are important in a lot of ways, but they're secondary to that relationship and that sense of um, belief in your child that the adult needs to foster and demonstrate every day. Did that answer your question? On? Okay. I, I have a question. Oh, yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you touched upon a little bit on the curriculum and the diversifying the curriculum. So I'm interested in knowing, you know, what sort of scaling you might be thinking about and how do we ensure that by implementing such diverse curriculum, how do we ensure that the teachers may also overcome any implicit bias of their own? Too, but um, that's a very good question, and that Summer Institute, which we couldn't make big on the screen, was, um, is very much a part of that. So a big, and there's, a, there's now a lot of professional development for teachers. You know, our teaching force is still 79% white, and our student population is now 51% students of color overall for the total public schools in this country. So there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of work to recruit teachers of color into the profession, but there's also a lot of work to reskill and educate white teachers, um, particularly in suburbs where the demographics are changing quickly and those teachers have been working with white students um, for many years and now the demographics are, are different. So there's a lot of work on racial literacy, we call it, in education. Um, and helping teachers deal with their own baggage um, and their own racial identities as it relates to others. I mean, we all grow up in this society. We're all products of this. And we, sometimes we have to unlearn what we've learned as a, when we're adults, right? Because we realize that we've learned something that's just very poisonous, and it, when, particularly in this country when it relates to race. And so we work on that racial literacy for teachers, and then we work on pedagogical strategies, so curriculum and teaching and just starting to give them ideas. And it's amazing how those two things interact with each other and support each other. So as you're helping teachers kind of rethink what intelligence is, kind of what ability is in a multimodal, multicultural way of thinking about that um, and understanding different kids' insights and perceptions that may be culturally based and appreciating difference, it helps them work on their own racial identity and realize that their own way of knowing the world is not the only way to know the world and that um, there's many ways to be smart. And um, so it's, it's hard work, but um, the teachers who want to do it um, and engage in it, they, you see amazing things. By the end of our institute, people were hugging each other, and it was, you know, this changed my life. I wish my colleagues could come. So, and that was just four days. I mean, so we could do a lot more, and there are programs that work within schools and go to schools and work with them. So you're right. بالبداية أحب أن أشكر جميع الحضور اللي ساعدون أنا ما عندي سؤال لكن بس عندي بعض الإطراء أحب أنه يكون يأخذون العمل بصورة جدية وفعالة لأن إحنا أطفالنا أو إحنا جايين نحظى بعض الريد بعض الاهتمام لأن إحنا جايين نبحث عن أولادنا إحنا جايين نبحث الأولادنا عن الأمان for our kids we came here in order to provide our kids with good education and provide peace for them وإحنا جينا نبحث عن الأمان ونوفر لهم فرصة للحياة. We search for peace for our kids here. فأتمنى أن يكون الاهتمام والتداخل بالمجتمع يكون حقيقي وفعال. And uh, for and therefore we would like to, to let this uh, um, ingredients uh, more benefits for our uh, kids. لأن لما يكون الطفل عايش بأمان راح يقدر يتداخل بحياته المجتمع. Because when the kids uh, are living in a peace uh, in a peace society, so he will be integrated in uh, in this society in a good way. وشكرا طبعا مرة ثانية. Thank you very much again. Thank you. My name is Rodan Tobiasio. Uh, thank you. Even if I'm late, for all of everything. I'm a parent. 
uh, this is very good. You know, I just want to point out a curriculum is something studied by people who know what, how to do it. Not the parents, not the students. This is one thing I should tell you. A curriculum is something very difficult for us to explain it physically like this. These psychologies and everything it gives us. It's good to have it, a diverse one. But what about the life of the students in the schools? Each every parents go to the schools? Are the teachers know what is happening in the schools? Not all. I've been traveling all the schools, Rocky, King Middle, and all the schools. What is happening there? What should the society do? I think these parents should ask, what should we do for these students in the schools? Some are smoking, some are doing what? The curriculum can be done, we like it, we accept it, we are very happy. We want this curriculum to be to help our children become good leaders. But let us pay attention to immigrants. Will it be good for them all? Thank you. I did, yeah. Um, <clears throat> well, yeah, I really do want to respond because um, I think what you're talking about is really, really important uh -huh. and fundamentally what we're here to talk about. And um, I, your, your question is, uh, as a parent, um, you're wondering how do you make your children feel better in these situations where it seems like the system is not catered to you. Um, and I would like to honestly say that I don't necessarily know the answer to that because I was disenfranchised at a very young age for very similar reasons. So maybe that can add some light to the severity of what this man's talking about. Um, it, can, it can diminish your quality of life as a child, but it can also make you not necessarily want to buy into education going forward, which in some ways can also diminish your quality of life. Um, and it really just adds to the wage gap and inequality. Um, but I would actually like for Marion to answer this question, if you don't mind, um, because I've been out of school for a while. And you are, you, you've been most recently in this school system, so if you don't mind, do you, do you mind feel, feeling? Of course, yeah. Um, I feel like, I mean, education and everything is important, but um, in order for a child to really feel like they're part of, you know, a curriculum or like a school is, I feel like, having you know groups and I was part of this um, group usually in the high schools it's called make it happen and it's a college readiness kind of um, multilingual organization for high school students um, to seek out opportunities to um, get involved within their community um, community volunteering um, summer programs and whatnot and um, I feel like once you know, there is a, you know, sense of social engagement with, you know, peers who are going through the same thing, you know, that other students are going through, you know, whether they're not happy with themselves or their education, having, you know, someone who looks like them or another person of color to share that experience with, I feel like will help them thrive um, emotionally, you know, and academically. Um, and I feel like that has for me, you know, being involved in multiple organizations where I'm working with kids who look like me, who are you know, the same socioeconomic status as I may be, um, really helped me thrive in my academics and um, know that I kind of belong somewhere and that um, there is a sense of, you know, hope continuing further. And I, thank you, Miriam. And I just want to add, um, I, I think that we are an amazing school system, that we have um, wonderful things that the experiences that Miriam had as part of Make It Happen are the kinds of experiences that we want to provide for all of our students. But I do think that we have a tremendous amount of work to do. And I think that the fact that we're doing what we're doing here today, uh, Parent University, is part of our effort to make sure that we understand what it is that our students need and that we are working together as a community to provide 
the types of experiences to all of our students, whether they're uh, students of color or um, white students in the school system, the opportunities to experience the value of that which Amy spoke of, which is the tremendous value that comes from being in a diverse setting, learning with people who are different from you day in and day out. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of work that we need to do. Um, we are currently working to create uh, opportunities for all of our teachers to develop the cultural tools to be able to work with our diverse students and to be able to maximize the value of that diversity in our school system. So um, we have tons of work to do, but we also, I'm always incredibly encouraged working in this community where there is a commitment to um, living and being side by side with people that are different. And I think, you know, if you, if you uh, think of some of the experiences that, um, that Amy talked about, the experience in cities like New York, I lived in Chicago, um, the, the, the realities are very different from the realities that we have in Portland. And I think that many of us love being here because of that. And I think that that's why it's important for us to figure out how do we work together to preserve that commitment to diversity, that commitment to living and learning next to people that are different from, um, from us. And I think that that's uh, something that we, it's not, we're never going to be done. It's part of our, um, our work as a school district and it's part of our work as a community uh, on an ongoing basis. Marhaba. Uh, Hi, everybody. Uh, Thank you very much for having me here. I really like your work here and I appreciate that very much. And I'm believing now. Uh, because uh, yes. I believe we, we have the same Ministry of Education. What? So there, there's two steps. There's education and socialization and there's learning. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's education before the learning. That's why, because we are going to create a, a new generation. Because spend most of them, them times at schools. So that's why. So that's maybe very important for them to keep them uh, quiet and uh, uh, in base, in base. So they can make their future. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shukran lakum. Um, my name is Edward Laboki. I'm one of the staff at the Multilingual Multicultural Center, but I am also a parent with students in the, port, in, the in the district. I have heard you, Amy, uh, and one of your uh, one one particular area in your presentation. Uh, uh, I, I, I kept me asking a lot of questions. I would like to ask you to clarify about uh, the diversity in schools as a concept and not a reality. Is that a national uh, data or it is 
it is uh, the specific areas in the country because I believe uh, the district where I am, I do see that there are realities and not only concept. So I would like some clarification on that. Thank you. I'm sorry, could you, could you say more about the realities? I'm not sure. Oh, oh Edward, you got to follow up. Um, any question of clarification? About the, when you said realities versus... Yeah, I, you, you, what I heard was uh, diversity as a concept by some white parents in its, uh, in its state of as a reality. They accept it as a concept, but not as a reality. That is what I heard. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So um, I was trying to draw the distinction between what... And the, and the reason why I was focusing on white, highly educated parents is because they tend to be the ones who have the most choice in the system, whether it's moving somewhere else or making a choice within the educational system. But they'll say in their opinion poll data or survey research that they support, they're most likely, compared to other white parents, to support uh, diversity as a concept, that they put their kids in a diverse school. But then when you look at the choices that they actually make, they're making very segregated choices. Um, so they're, they're trying to keep their uh, children in high status schools, with, or perceived to be high status schools, that are often segregated white and affluent schools. So they say one thing and they're doing another, which is, which is pretty, it's pretty well documented. Now there's been more and more research on it. Um, not, that's not saying every white parent does that or every white well-educated parent, but there's a relationship between those, those two things. One, answering the survey question in that way and B, making the choice to maintain higher status. Does that help? I just want to say something related to that too, which is I think that inclu um, inclusion is a big part of that because I think a lot of times we, it happens a lot in Portland I've noticed, which is we talk a lot about diversity, but in terms of actually including minorities in discussions about diversity that often doesn't happen. In the Portland schools it does and, in, and for instance in the schools it's something where I, I did some student teaching and then some teaching in a number of school districts around here. and. I noticed that whereas diversity is celebrated everywhere, it really makes a difference that in the Portland schools there's an effort to create a diverse workforce and a diverse teaching force. Because you can talk to students all you want and how they can be anything they want. But if they see that their parents aren't doing what they're skilled at and that their teachers all look one way, then it's hard for them to believe in what we're talking about with diversity. So I think that is something we really need to grapple on in Portland, which is if we are for diversity, then we also really fight for inclusion and representation across the board. I'm going to jump on this too. Um, one, one thing that sort of comes to mind for me, it's sort of tangentially related to this, is um, I think part of the reason why there might be more of a stated preference for diversity that isn't necessarily met in reality is that um, we sort of shy away from difference still. I think there's this like philosophical like, oh yeah, diversity definitely, difference is important, but there's still some sort of a lack of understanding of what difference is and the role that it should play in communities. Um, and I see, and I'm speaking mainly from a perspective of a white guy in communities um, similar to me, other white people that I know. There's a lot of, like, I get what difference is all about. Um, I'm all for it. I'm not a racist. Not a racist. And then, like, it's all good. Except there, it's kind of met with this lack of understanding of the role that difference should play. So it's not, um, I, I guess the, the best way I could sum it up is I've heard the phrase, I don't see color before. And, or I'm colorblind, as if that should be the goal. That, like, that we shouldn't, that the role of difference should be invisible. And um, I <laughs> I don't think that's the point. I think, I think the point is for people to not only perceive difference, but to have it, to have a, a way of sort of addressing it and expressing curiosity that's healthy and respectful, um, and, and a way to sort of have difference play a role in our society where we can, it, we can be proud of who we are as individuals, as people who are different, um, but also not to you know, rely too heavily on differences as stereotypes. Um, so part of it, I think, is, is expressing, being willing to express some curiosity 
with people where you might not otherwise feel it, or getting over this sort of like, how can I ask this question of someone who isn't like me? Um, you know, there are ways to do it without just saying like, well, there's no, I don't see difference. Everyone's the same because they're not, and that's okay. Difference can be generative. It can be, it can be healthy. <laughs> Hi. I have two kids in the Portland public school system, and one on the way um, in a couple months, and then a few more years. Um, and I, I think your name was Edward, the person who asked the last question. And I wanted to give you an example, because actually my, my point is a really good example of that. So my daughter started in the Spanish immersion program at Lyseth, which was an incredible opportunity, and it was beautiful to hear her speaking another language, and it was like, an opportunity that I never had and always wanted. Um, and at the same time, we didn't fit in, and we are white, <laughs> um, but it was, it, was, it was almost exclusively, maybe exclusively, upper middle class and upper class white people and white appearing people. There was some racial and ethnic diversity, but everyone was definitely um, living with white privilege. In that entire class, there were two kids of color, and they both dropped out immediately. Um, I fought hard to change it. I actually became the parent representative for my grade both of the years my daughter was there, and that was my top priority. And it was really difficult to change it. And, and this isn't a group of people who want their children to learn another language so bad. Like, they care about diversity so bad, that, you know, like, they're going out of their way to put their kid in a class where English isn't even being spoken at all. Um, so that kind of shows the discrepancy between like, these are people who want diversity and are also opting out of the, like, the public setting with a very diverse community and into a very like, um, not diverse setting. And I eventually pulled my child out, which was a painful and hard decision because it was an amazing opportunity, but we're at Brzomskat now. Um, and my kids don't speak Spanish, but they're surrounded with friends who do speak many different languages and um, so I think it's really important, and I just wanted to give like a local example of that. And also like a challenge to all of us, because I know as white people, if you're white in the room, um, that it can be really scary and really hard to admit that like our impact is different than our intention. Um, that like what we're doing isn't, like we're doing harm even when we're trying to do good. But we are all growing up in this society, we are like if we're white. and. We're all swimming in this, and we are all carrying this racism within us. And that program was sort of a good example of it. And I just, my challenge to, to you all who organized this event is, um, I, in, in that program in part two, was that we sort of, when we talk about white people and then people of color, we sort of mostly talk about rich white people. Um, and I'll just tell you, I grew up in multi-generational poverty. I was orphaned and homeless as a teenager. Um, and so, I, I just want you to know that we're, we're not all rich white people. Um, and that there's actually, a, we're an important link because there are ways that I can relate at Presumpscot to the other parents around me way more than I could relate to the upper class families um, in that, that more elite program. Um, I would like leave birthday parties crying, for example, because <laughs> um, of the classism I was experiencing. Whereas now I like have a ton of friends. I love going to school. I coach both my kids' basketball teams. Like, I feel a part of the community. So there's a lot of benefit in not just focusing on upper class white people, um, because a lot of us have shared experiences because we share other identities like class or, you know, other things. So don't forget next year if you have a panel, have some poor white people in the room. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, my name is Meryl. I think that my question are really for the uh, families and parents who are here um, who are of color and do speak non-English as their first language, that I've raised um, four kids in the Portland public schools and I've worked down in Kennedy Park for five years in and out of families' homes. And one of the things that um, I observed but didn't really get solved, and I don't think it's a quick solving, is in order for the kids to feel really comfortable in school and the teachers to feel that, I feel like we need to bring more of the families that we're teaching these children that we're trying to make sure their needs get met. And what I've observed all these years of being involved in the public schools is that 
there are more white parents that come and I want to know what do we need to do so that those of you that aren't coming, your friends aren't coming, you know, your neighbors aren't coming, those of you, what do we need to do so the parents are more involved in the schools? Because I feel like sometimes, you know, we send these kids off that speak a different language at home and we do our best to love them and res respect them, but I feel like in order to really make it a more holistic understanding of what diversity is, we really need to kind of embrace each of our families. And that really includes knowing, you know, like most of the PTAs are white, right? Do you all agree with that? Well, I don't like that, but I don't really know myself what's needed. And even when I worked in Kennedy Park for five years, and I worked with another 300 groups of refugee families, I still don't understand what do we need to learn so that our system opens up to include your thoughts and your beliefs and your desires. Does that make sense? So I think it's really to some of the parents, if anybody want to share what we can do. Whoa. <laughs> oh. Can I answer the question? Yeah. You know, we are like people in the ocean. We allow the children to go and swim. Yeah. When they are swimming there, you cannot say that this is a white child, Spanish, Africa. They continue swimming. They learn something. I have my son, he plays basketball. I think many people know him. He's taller than me now. But most of his friends are American, Spanish, Iraqis. When he was sick in the hospital, every day children come almost 20 to 30, of different colors. Even all the doctors were tired. They say, is this a president? <laughs> Sincerely, they say, is this a president? Everybody coming to see him. Why? I was even surprised, you know. I see, I've never seen like, ladies leaving their parents coming to the hospital. You know? They are very strict. But they came because of my son. I'm very proud of that. The Iraqis who are here, thank you. You are, you are daughters came to see my son in the hospital. That is diversity. He's a basket player. I've been a player too. Let us just allow the system go. There is nothing which can stop it. We are diverse in Poland, especially Poland. Nobody should worry about that. After five, six years, we are going to have somebody, a governor. No immigrant. Don't worry about that. Thank you. Thank you. I see everybody turning back. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, my name is Bertley, um, Bertley Despacho. Um, I just uh, would like to talk a little bit um, about uh, the point uh, uh, I forgot the name, but the lady over that made about families coming to school activities or participate more. We have a we have a great community, African community. They have a a tradition, and uh, one thing the school needs to do more is um, culture break, uh, break or culture break. We need to talk more with the families to know to know what's going on in the community, what is uh, what uh, what's a part of the culture, what's not part of the culture, and also the parents need to know uh, about the white people culture. Uh, and uh, here in Portland or Maine. The, the people of color that come here is mostly from Africa. Uh, I would say it's not African American, because we we have to understand that when uh, when we have a people, uh, black people here from America was born here. Part of the third or second generation was born here. Uh, it's different, but these people come from different um, country, different school systems. Um, and they grew up in um, maybe a very poor situation. All in their country, they had a good life too. 
So I have been working with a lot of family and they also talk about that, why they don't go to school. Because the number of the students that go to principal office increase here in, in Portland than the white kids. Black kids are mostly going to the principal office like our panel say, said. And we also have a lot of black kids going to AIP, IP, um, special education, and the family asking questions. Why us? Why us? The number increasing. Why we have more kids uh, with the less um, score in school? Why when our kids finish high school, they don't have opportunity to get a, a good scholarship like other black, uh, white kids? why our kid doesn't have the same opportunity. So therefore, they decide to kind of refuse some service. If you ask me to call a parent today, ask them to come to this meeting, they will, that's not for us, that's for them. We don't want to go, our kid is not part of this society. Thank you, thank you so much. I hear, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. Hey, uh, I've, uh, I've, I have a kid, I have, I have two students, the one at Deering High School, I know the principal is here, I'm, I'm, uh, I have been talking to schools, and I have another one, Eliza. I heard her when she say about the Spanish class. It's shame on us. I tried to put my son in that class. They came with a lot of excuses. I end up not, my son ended up not going to that class. My son was, he, was, he grew up in Houston, Texas. And he, for oh, everybody know, Texas, uh, uh, we have a lot of Spanish speaking. My son was in Spanish class. He speaks three languages now. He speaks he speak Spanish, Portuguese, and English. He's only seven years old, speaking those three languages very well. So, <laughs> but the school system and uh, Lyset, uh, Lyset refused to have my son on that class, the Spanish class. They came with a lot of, Oh, we're in the middle of the, uh, the, the year, we have this, we have this, we have, but at the end, and one thing the black folks don't like to hear, especially Africa, I'm sorry with the big smile. We usually think that's very fake. I'm just trying to pass that along for parents. If you say I'm sorry to black folks, especially from Africa, and say I'm sorry, I really wanted to help you, but I can't. That, make sure you don't do that, because that family, when they leave, because when we say sorry, we say sorry, and we meant it. We say sorry, we can't do it. So you see my face, you say, yeah, he's very sorry. So if you say sorry, at the same time you open that smile. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of work that the street school, uh, the, um, I, I, I thank my, my, my boss, they're all here. They, we're doing a, a very good job by talking to those families in the community. We are part of this community. We're helping our people to understand the American side. And, uh, and we wish to the teachers to understand our side too as African. We African, we're African. I usually say we're not African American. We African, black from Africa, from Africa that grew up in different culture, grew up with a different idea, and our people is very smart. Imagine your kids grew up and speak five languages, five languages at home without being taught taught in class or school. The the school system is all in one class. But you learn those language from your grandpa, from mom, from dad. So it's just uh, for school to know that we are open to those. But the way the white uh, teachers, the white system provide those, those uh, service to us is in a, in a way that black folks see it as a fake way. So we don't buy that. So just to make it clear, um, everybody understand my point. Thank you so much. Speak English, but law is English. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I speak English, but my English no good. But I try. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I have two kids. Uh, uh, start from Prefiton to uh, middle school and high school, and I, I happy. I have been with the teachers, I have been with the school, because before, long time ago, I have 
very bad side. Uh, I talking about, I say same, they saying, my kids, uh, nobody help me, my kids, teacher and mentor, my kids, I scary for that thing. And I go to inside the school, I work in help me nine years. I help the kids because I want to beside my kids. I just want to stay with my kids. I volunteer in five years and four years I, uh, 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 I hire. And I go to inside the school, I see the kids, what they're doing. I see the teachers, what they're doing. I change my mind, what I told before and what I talking before. Like she talking about it right now. I have different uh, mind, but right, I go inside the school, I have different mind with the teachers. I sit with my kids inside the house, I talk with my kids, I say, listen to me. If the teacher is man, die your father. And the teacher is uh, woman, die your mother. You have to expect it, like a mother and father. Before, I don't know what they're doing, but right now I know exactly what's going on. They help me too much. Uh, kids, they, they teaching and they care. We have uh, just like nighttime, the kids inside the house. All day, they were the teachers with the school. They help me a lot. They don't need us to give him some uh, uh, back to him what they're doing for us. But the uh, mother is in the house, our father is in the house. They, I don't know that thing. But the, I go inside the school. I stay with the kids a long time. I, do, I know everything going on there. I, I spoke to teachers and the principal and all the people working there. I, I don't know for I give him, but I, I have it for them. And they, I, I have, I have it too much for them because my kids, they grow their hand. They help him a lot. They no need me every, anything I, I give him, they help them. They, they every time to do, if they need to read, need, need the kids, help me, they, they help me. I am from Africa, but my kids are not Africa. But the, we both side, and the, my kids, they help me. And the teachers help me every side. We no need talking about culture. We no need talking about, you know, uh, uh, the different color. We live one place. We, one, we, we, we are one family. We have to expect each other. We have to know uh, if the same white wrong, we no give all the white wrong. We have to know we help each other a lot. The kids, we no need the, uh, we adult people, we no need talking about it. that thing because kids, they taking what we saying. The kids, they mean each other in their school. If they listen, the parents are talking like that, the kids mean to, to each other. I, I used to help the kids. I say, if I see the white kids, the black kids, they sit there, I, meet, I try to make him friend. I try to talk to him, sit between them. I say, we are one family. We are one glass. You see? That you friend. That you, you family. I just not working. I just make a happy the kids. I help the kids. But I, I fire my I fire in my job, the people, because I... I help the kids both sides. They don't need me, I do that job, but I have this also, I don't have problem, the firing, but uh, I kids, I help them more what they need. I leave my, I, I make my, what the, like a mother, the kids, all the kids, and the girl working with me, she go to Baronsable, she say, the, she working more, uh, help me more, like, like a family, but but it's okay, no problem. But I need the family together. We are, we need together. We don't need talking about black and white. We need one, one family. We need the kids to know here that thing, please. We need the kids to stay happy, please. So right, right here. Can, can I uh, have a response from here? I actually just wanted to say, I, I would regret it for a long time if I just, just didn't take a moment um, as we're wrapping up to celebrate all of you. Um, what Grace didn't tell me was how magnificent and moving it would be just to witness this dialogue among parents um, in this community. And uh, the investment of time and energy 
that you're demonstrating um, by being here in this room today is really moving. Um, and it's an investment that I want to tell you is going to pay off not only in the lives that your kids leave, but in my life and the life, lives of everybody in this room and the lives of people who are far away from this room. Um, because the truth is, the, at least the way that I see it, there are really two uh, foundries of our democracy, places where it's manufactured, cultivated, sustained. One is New England, uh, but the second uh, is our schools. Um, and the investment you're making today is going to pay off and, and ripple out far beyond the lives that your kids lead. And it, it's actually a profound form of political expression, putting your kids in public schools, in Portland public schools. Um, I think it's one of the most profound forms of political expression that you can make. And I just want to take a minute to celebrate that because it's very moving and exciting to me to see all of the faces gathered in this room and, and hear this conversation. It's very heartening. So I just wanted to celebrate that. Um, we're about to r wrap up. Um, I think I hear the children louder or... <laughs> um, There's a man over here who had a question real there, quick. I don't know if he's still there. Oh. He's gone? Hi. So I just, I wanted to, um, I wanted to um, say that um, this is just the beginning of the conversation. He's back. <laughs> Wait, he's back. He's back. Did you want to say something? <laughs> I'm Patrick. Actually, uh, I long very much to talk about oh, just question of two, two minutes. I don't know how long I speak as also I'm a citizen. Because uh, I have kids in the schools. We have all different uh, ideas or thinking. But one thing I see is that we know maybe we can think racism is over or divides, we speak about divides. Just what I want to ask or speak about is this one. Whenever there is problem between white boy and a black boy, a black has to be sent home to stay, either a week home, but the white one has to stay in the school. I don't know why this one has to happen. And we see that it is really something good or there's no racism issue in the society. I want to ask you, how long will it take for us to end up differences like this? Or to put it aside, but come with something concrete? Or calls like uh, calling other children like chocolate or monkey and so on that can make them really feel sad. We need to talk about this also. We need to make this one very strictly in school so that it can up, end up and we can stay just one, like, one family and one society which is highly developed and uh, we are now I don't know. This is what I want to talk about. Oh, I, I, I want you to talk about a little bit. Oh, if the school can end up, it can make everyone happy. I believe this is true. Thank you. So I was just going to say that this is really the beginning of a conversation. And um, even in the school district, we also have, our, in a big, deep way, looking at this difficult conversations of race, how do we respond, and how do we all work together. Um, so, so it's the system itself and then with the parents. So we want to make sure that every, all of us are on the same page in terms of looking at all of these um, issues that will be beneficial for our community are not just our children, but the entire collective of a community. Um, so <clears throat> we have other workshops or classes for parents, and we intended for today um, to gather um, information from each one of you, but we looking at we don't have time to do it. But we do it as an exit ticket that people can we, just we, do something we, as we want do. you to. Um, there are. This paper, uh, chart paper is on the wall, and if you could look at the two, particularly the top two big questions, and particularly the second one. So one, what we were asking is, what is one big takeaway for you? What did you learn? What's your aha moment? Um, what, and then the second question, what should parents and schools do to address, concretely, integration? 
And then there are just other topics of, you know, future topics for parent um, university. So it, you can have time, go around and write your thinking about uh, today so we have that information. Can I, can I say something? Because um, I think it's important, um, especially in light of the, the comment that um, the last parent made. Uh, we recognize as a school system that we have tremendous disparities. I talked about uh, that when I um, introduced Amy about the differences in performance. Our equity goal is, you know, front and center about reducing those disparities. It's about recognizing that they exist, that there are disciplinary uh, differences, that we treat students of color differently from how we treat white students, that um, we have overrepresentation of students of color in special education and underrepresentation of students of color in our advanced uh, programs. Those are things that we recognize and, you know, I have to tell you I'm incredibly encouraged being here today with all of you um, beginning this dialogue. This is not a dialogue that is easy for anybody. Clearly, as somebody who cares deeply about the school system, it hurts me to recognize that, that those are our realities, but at the same time, if we don't do it, we're gonna continue to be looking at them forever and ever and ever. And so I'm incredibly encouraged that we are here having this conversation, and um, it's a tremendous step forward for us as a district. And unless we do this, unless we have these conversations, unless we tackle the disparities, um, will never be what I know everybody in this room wants us to be. And I think we can be that. And so, again, I'm super encouraged that you're all here as part of that conversation.